And so, in kind of a in laws of balance, you had one law with Islam, now we have our Christianity. I've not, I've not come here to refute Christianity today. This is not my objective. I've not come here to demonize Christians. Not my objective. I, I, I was born here, I was once a Christian. I know that Christians are decent. The general concord is Christians are very decent and uh, loving people. I've come here to talk about orthodoxy, Christian orthodoxy. That, um, and in a way, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be representing Christian Orthodoxy, funny enough, in the biggest irony. I'm going to discuss what Christian scholarship throughout the years has discussed talked about these verses. Not myself, not Muslim opinions, not Muslim trying to twist things, but Christian scholarship from ancient times till now, as some of the greatest scholars. But firstly, I'd like to mention Nabil and David Wood, or Nabil is the other person that was debating me last on Tuesday. They like to bring up a few points with Islam. Well, a few of these points are that Islam believes in offensive wars of conversion, that we, will, we want to conquer the world and force people to become uh, Muslim. I, I hope I demonstrated on Tuesday that that wasn't the case, but perhaps you can see the video for yourself on the website. Uh, the second point I mentioned is war is for the name of, of, uh, of God only in Islam. Uh, this is true. When we do fight wars, we do fight in the name of God, but mainly because we don't believe in fighting for nationalism or fighting for um, material gain as our primary motive. And it didn't make it better to fight for material gain than fight for God. At least with God, you've got some rules of justice, you've got some objectives. With material gain, it's about exploiting people and their resources, which is unjust. Thirdly, um, David alleged that Muslims lie where necessary to, uh, to get themselves out of, uh, out of pickle, so to speak, to feign peacefulness when they're weak, but when we're strong, we're going to be very rough and uh, tyrannical. Again, I, um, I, on Tuesday, I believe I demonstrate otherwise, but again, we'll, we'll discuss this further. Um, also, the fourth point he believes is that our Muslims hold a, a low opinion of women. Now, what I'm going to say today is that I believe that these, the issues that he brought up were not, not real issues, and, I, and they were not um, as he described them as. Muslims don't hold a low opinion of women, they hold a greater opinion of women, which is why uh, they're, they're covered up, but we're not here to talk about Islam today. So. But I think the point today is, I and mean, my message is very simple to David and other Christians of his opinions and his background, uh, do not look into the splint of your brother's eye, lest there be a log in your eye. If you are criticizing other people, then the same can be said using your, your own criteria on you. And today I'm going to play the devil's advocate and use David Wood's criteria, his own criteria, on his own religion. Because he applied it on, on Islam, so we'll use it on his religion. But I will then demonstrate how the classical Christian scholarship and what that says, and then we'll see what the uh, Christianity really believes. I will show that, yeah, that Christianity does believe that uh, in war, killing, punishment, the infliction of pain, and even torture. But it was never done for evil motives. In fact, this was done out of love. And I know this sounds incredulous, but it really was. The classical, uh, classical Christians always did these things out of the concept that they were trying to help people. I, although, as I said, I, I, I don't condemn uh, warfare, provided it's done in just cases, but um, there are some issues I'd like to contend and some issues I'd like to raise. Is Christianity a mission of peace? Well, of course, Christianity desires peace. And, and anyone who says Christianity does not desire peace, then they're lying because Christianity does, and everyone knows this. As we know from the Old Testament, in the book of Judges, Exodus, and Leviticus, it describes peace as being something that, uh, which is in three things. One of them being peace given to you um, from God, one of them being satisfaction and contentment, and the other one being security, but not the absence of war. For example, in Leviticus it says, And you shall eat bread to the full and dwell on the land uh, peacefully. You shall chase your enemies, and they shall fall before you by the sword. So you will live in peace. But your enemies will be falling to your swords, you'll be victorious against your enemies, according to Leviticus in the Old Testament. So, uh, peace is not necessarily the absence of war, it means security, justice, and contentment. So, 
which Christianity is original peace. And that sounds a bit odd, because there are actually different Christianities, there are different interpretations, different backgrounds. David Wood is from a particular branch of Christianity, and obviously they're, uh, they're, they're quite strong in America. Obviously here in England we're from different branches of Christianity, and perhaps we have different understandings. But there are generally three Christian sects, I like to say, three Christian parties or groups regarding the issue of um, uh, peace and authority and war and so on in Christianity. One of them are those who are Christians who are divorced from life's affairs, divorced from politics. And these people, um, you might know them as the Mennonites, the Quakers, or in general the Anabaptist traditions which were persecuted in Europe and left to America. And perhaps maybe they would descend from that branch. The other uh, kind are those who are the submissive to authority Christians, I like to nickname them. Those are Christians who, they, will sub they, uh, they submit to government authority, they will go to war if the government tells them to, but uh, generally as individuals, they are peaceful. As a government, as a state structure, they can be uh, indulging in warfare. So that's the second group. And the third group of Christians are those who actually have power. The, the, the uh, theo theocratic Christians, which perhaps don't, don't exist so much anymore, but theocratic Christians are those who actually, when they get to power, they believe the Bible still guides them when they're in power. And we'll see what that means. So those the Christians which are divorced from life's affairs, those, those Christians, the Mennonites, the Quakers, generally the branch of the Anabaptist tradition. Edmund Burke said to, the, those, to these uh, group of Christians who advocate no violence whatsoever, and in a lot of cases advocate not even participation in government, in any way, shape, or form. Edmund Burke says, the only thing necessary for the triumph of evil is for good men to do nothing. If we didn't uh, fight, then the Nazis would be speaking German, it would be a Nazi regime, the Jews would be kicked out, uh, and massacred, uh, or rather, in the Holocaust. No one would have rescued them. And I, and I guess the question is, what kind of love is this? Are we meant to fight for the weak and the oppressed? Don't um, all good Christians believe that we must help the weak? You know, if you are if you're a person of strength, then you can use violence against the oppressors to defend those who are the defenseless. Now, he might say, but oh, I pull these, these uh, verses of the Bible, and how can you answer them? And he said, oh, you know, you, you, when you Muslims, when you quote these verses of the Bible, you're going to do twist it and you distort it. Now, I'm not going to have not enough time to discuss my whole presentation, but I am at least going to discuss these verses of the Bible. He brought, he brought up um, Matthew 10, 34, where Jesus said, Do not suppose that I have come to bring peace to the earth. I did not come to bring peace, but a sword. Obviously, he was, he was saying, oh, obviously, he did not come to bring peace, but a sword. Now, he said, the Muslims twist this. So I'm not going to give my opinion on this. I'm not going to give it. I'm going to give Thomas Aquinas' opinion on this in his Summa Theologica in the book. Now, this is not, it's not Muslim. He was a great, Catholic, well, a great Christian theologian. And I can give Calvin and Aquinas, but I'm going to... I'm going to uh, give their opinions to other places because place, there's too many. Aquinas said, those who wage war justly aim at peace, and so they are not opposed to peace, except to the evil peace which our Lord came not to send upon this earth. So, that, so what Jesus was saying was there's an evil peace, which he has not come to bring uh, an evil peace whereby injustice is tolerated. Rather, he believes in fighting inju uh, injustice and, and creating justice. This is the kind of peace he wants to create by struggle. And, and Thomas Aquinas uh, replicated this here. They would mention blessed are the pe peacemakers, for they should be called the sons of God. Augustine, in his epistle to Boniface, said, Peace should be the object of your desire. War should be waged only as necessity, and waged only that God may deliver men from the necessity and preserve them in peace. For peace is not sought in order for the kindling of war, but war is waged in order that peace may be obtained. Therefore, in waging war, cherish the spirit of the peacemaker, that by conquering those you attack, you may lead them into the advantage of peace. For our Lord says, Blessed are the peacemakers, for they should be the children of God. If, however, peace among men be so sweet as procuring temporal safety, how much more is that peace with God that procures from men eternal felicity of the angels? Let us you, therefore, and not your will, slay the enemy that fights against you. So not you doing it gratuitously, but let the will of God, the, the will to do justice, be the one that guides your hand to slaughter the enemy. In other, there are, I'm going to quote them, uh, there's, there's so many uh, commentaries I'm going to quote, quote but I'm going to only quote, quote a few that he brought up. But he said when uh, Peter was uh, facing the Romans, he took out a sword and cut, cut one of the, the, uh, the guard, temple guards of the Romans uh, ears off. 
And he said, put away your sword, for I realize unto you, whoever lives by the sword dies by the sword. Augustine, the great church father, Augustine, now I, I can't, I can't discuss Augustine enough, enough. He is excellent. I read his book on the Trinity. It is amazing. It's the basis for the Christian understanding of the Trinity. He was a very logical person. And he, and he, I mean, his contribution to Christianity is you can't calculate it. It's, all of us have doctrines and beliefs which were solidified by him. Augustine said, So also a rash judgment frequently does no harm to him that is the object of the rash judgment. But to him who judges rashly, the rashness itself must necessarily do harm. According to such a rule, I judge of that saying also, whoever strikes with the sword shall perish with the sword. For how many take the sword and do not perish with the sword? Peter himself being an instance. So, so Augustine is saying that um, what he refers to is, don't your first recourse to everything be, I'm going to take my sword out. That's not your first recourse to everything. You know, it, you can use it, but only at certain times where it's, it's moderated, where it should be at that time, appropriate time. Barat and Augustine saying, and if everyone who wields the sword perishes by the sword, then Peter did not perish by the sword because he took up the sword. And likewise, did uh, uh, the, the warrior prophets of the Old Testament, the Psalm, they took up the sword. They didn't die by the sword. So that the meaning he's inferring makes no sense. Augustine is explaining it for us. Also, the eye for an eye verse, and do not resist evil verse, which obviously he's already quoted in Matthew and Romans. Augustine said, It is supposed that God could not enjoin warfare because in after times it was said by the Lord Jesus Christ, I say unto you, resist not evil, but if anyone strike thee on the right cheek, turn to him the left also. The answer is that this that is here required is not a bodily action, but an inward disposition. If someone strikes you on the cheek, what Augustine is saying is that it's not that he can't be punished for this by the state authorities. Or that if any attacks your country, you cannot strike back and defend yourself. Rather, what he's saying is that if someone hits you, do not um, have hate in your heart for this person that hits you. Do not have hate in your heart. And the way to get around this hate is to strike, to turn it on the cheek, because that, that will uh, prevent hate from developing inside you. But justice should still be fought for. And as Augustine continues, what is the evil in war? It is the death of some who will die anyway. That others live in peaceful subjection? This is mere cowardly dislike, not any religious feeling. The real evils in war are love of violence, revengeful cruelty, fierce and implacable enmity, wild resistance and lust of power, and such like. And it's generally to punish those, uh, those things when forces are required to inflict punishment, that is, in obedience to God or some lawful authority, good men undertake laws, wars, when they find themselves in a position as regards to the conduct of human affairs, that right conduct becomes, uh, requires them to act or to make others act in that way. And, all, and he refers to Romans 13. Romans 13 is very interesting. I think this will sort of really uh, prove my point. Where is Augustine getting this from? Is he just pulling this out of thin air, his interpretation? Is he doing injustice to the text? Augustine, and, well, I'm going to quote um, Aquinas and the rest, of the, of the rest of the people later. It's Romans 13. This is the, the key text. Romans 13 is the crux. It says in Romans 13, Everyone must submit themselves to government authorities, for there is no authority except that which God has established. The authorities that exist have been established by God. Consequently, he who rebels against the authority is rebelling, rebelling against that which God has instituted. And those who, who do so will bring judgment on themselves. For rulers hold no terror to those who do right. But for those who do wrong, do you fear to be free from the fear of one in authority? Then do what is right and, commend, and, and he will commend you for. He is God's servant, servant to do good. But if you do wrong, be afraid, for he does not bear the sword for nothing. He is God's servant and agent of wrath to bring punishment on the wrongdoer. Therefore, it is necessary to submit to the authorities, not only because of the possible punishment, but also because of conscience. This is why you pay taxes for the authorities of God's servants, uh, who, who give their full time to governing and so on and so forth. And again, Martin Luther commented on this, on this. God be praised for that, for the very fact that the sword has been instituted by God to punish the evil, protect the good, and preserve peace. And then you, you, in brackets, you focus on Romans 13 and 1 Peter 2 13, which says the same thing. Is, is powerful and sufficient truth, true approved proof, that war and killing, along with all the things that accompany wartime and martial law, have been instituted by God. What else is war except the punishment of wrong by evil? Now, 
there are the other verses that he mentioned, which I've got commentaries for all of them, ranging from Thomas Aquinas to Augustine to uh, uh, Martin Luther to John Calvin. And they all say the same thing. They all actually, uh, they, I know they disagree on, on a lot of small things, but they all generally agree with each other that the ruling the government is being instituted to do violence to protect the weak. And as Christians, as individuals, we don't do violence, but we rely on the ruler to do violence on our behalf to protect us. And this ruler can be Christian. And, and if you are a soldier in the army, as a Christian, you can also do violence. And you are not uh, held reprehensible. Now, my time is short. I can discuss the evidences of why you're not reprehensible. These guys discuss it in depth. But we see in the evidences in the Bible where uh, uh, soldiers come to John. Soldiers come to John and they ask him for advice. John the Baptist. And he said, you know, what do we do? He replied, don't extort money, don't accuse people falsely, and be content with your pay. John the Baptist, who is, following, who, who is in the spirit of Christ, uh, led by the Holy Spirit, is telling these soldiers that, except be content with your pay, don't leave your work, stay with your work. You're, you're a soldier, you're provisioned to fight, yes, just don't extort money from people, don't make false witness, and be content with the money you get. But stay in your work. And again, Paul says this elsewhere, again I have the quotes for this, but I'm not going to waste a lot of my time. Uh, uh, saying repeating the same things. And again, we can discuss this more in the next period because I've got loads of quotations from classical scholarship, not from Muslims, not from Muslims twisting the texts, which he likes to allege. So those are the pacifists. The pacifists are a minority in the Christian world, a tiny minority, not the majority. The uh, submissive to authority Christians are the majority, and they follow these teachings, that we must submit to the authority, and yes, we can be soldiers, we can fight in wars. And of course, there are those Christians who have power. Now here's the thing, Christians who have power and decide now to, uh, to rule according to what God has revealed in the, in the Bible. Now as it says in the, in the verse of the Bible, which I have somewhere here, um, all scripture is good and useful for learning, teaching and training in, in uh, righteousness. So when a, a Christian opens the Bible, looks at the New Testament, right? I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm a king or a, or a leader of some kind, I look at the New Testament, Oh, huh, there's nothing here about ruling. Nothing here about ruling. What do I do? Oh, what's this book on the side? Oh, the Old Testament. So look here. Oh, there's lots of stuff about ruling here. Loads and loads. And then they start. They read it and they apply it. And we had obviously the, the obviously the, the Catholic Europe. We had the Puritan government of uh, Oliver Cromwell, which ruled for six months before it collapsed. And of course, uh, you know, we have the many crusades. Now he said these crusades do not represent my religion. I'm going to show you later. How these crusades do? Have, has he not held the arguments of these crusades? These crusades are very compelling. They use the law of love. They use the, the idea of the concept of the law of love, which I thought I'm going to discuss later. Why they have to go out and fight and take over other lands to help the people come to Christ? Because it's to save them. If you love them, you know, he who spares the rod hates his son, but he who uses the rod loves his son. This is uh, this is the verse in Proverbs, I believe. This is a, a wisdom that do not spare the rod if you love. And this is what will motivate the crusaders. Now, I'll just quote very briefly, time permitting. <clears throat> One and a half minutes. All right, no problems. Yeah. The, the person here, uh, the, the author of this book, God's War, said that uh, while theoretically in a perfect world, individual pacifism could be translated into political pacifism, the main thrust of Christian teaching assumed post lapsarian sin and imperfection. The Old Testament would bequeath stories of legitimate war pleasing to God from the Israelites, Joshua and King David, to Judas Maccabus, in contrast to modern Christians not of the biblical fundamentalist persuasion. No offense. The medieval church placed considerable importance in the Old Testament for its apparent histi history, or seen moral stories, its prophecies, and the prefig of the New Covenant. Now, yes, Christians are not under the Old Covenant. So you don't have to follow the 600 and so, and so on mitzvah laws that the Jews have to follow. Yeah, of course, you don't have to follow that. But the wisdom, the directions, the ideas, concepts in the Old Testament it is useful for teaching and learning in righteousness. And I will quote this later on from the, from the scholars, the, the classical scholars, who also back this up. But I hope you see now that it's not so black and white. Christians too believe in war. I'm not saying it's a bad thing. I say it's great that you believe that you should fight for justice against the oppressor. But I just think that this oversimplistic theology he's bringing, with from maybe a minority sect in Christianity, does not represent the true Christianity, and in fact will cause more harm to the world as people sit idly by watching oppressors take over the world and kill people. Thank you.